Good afternoon. My name is John Lindahl. I'd like to welcome you to the Nebraska State Historical Society's Brown Bag Lecture Series held here at the Museum of Nebraska History on the third Thursday of every month. A detailed schedule for this series, as well as information about all the Historical Society's programs and services, can be found on our website, which is nebraskahistory.org. Before I introduce today's speaker, I want to thank the Nebraska State Historical Society Foundation for funding the filming of these lectures. Their financial support allows us to tape and broadcast these programs on public access television. Our speaker today is Colonel Thomas Germans of Lincoln. He's the chief of the Joint Staff of the Nebraska National Guard, and he's going to talk about his deployment and activities in Afghanistan from 2005 to 2006. As I mentioned, it ties in with our special exhibit that we have here at the museum, Nebraska Citizen Soldier in the 21st Century. Colonel Kermans. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for, for showing up and, uh, and demonstrating interest in what uh, your citizen soldiers are doing uh, today in Afghanistan and Iraq and around the world. Uh, a little bit about myself, uh, I, this, this particular deployment, deployment was my second one. I deployed in Operation Desert Shield, Desert Storm, mobilized with uh, the Nebraska Army National Guard Unit, 24th Medical Company. So I had an opportunity to spend some time in the Middle East, uh, primarily in uh, Kuwait and Saudi Arabia at that time, and a little bit in Iraq. And so when this opportunity came along, since I'd already been to Iraq, and frankly there was nothing there that interested me to go back and see again, I thought I'd try something different. Uh, to kind of set the stage just a little bit about uh, the mission that I performed there, they called it the Embedded uh, Trainer Team. Uh, historically, that is a uh, special forces type mission, which they call FID or Forward Internal Defense, as you're training the, the country's own military forces to be able to provide its own security. And uh, in our case, this, this particular mission had just transitioned to the Guard because the scope of the mission was well beyond what our current Special Forces units could do. Our task was to grow the Afghan National Army to over 70,000 so soldiers in a very short period of time. And that's, uh, that was uh, quite a daunting task. Uh, myself and uh, 21 other Nebraskans uh, mobilized uh, right at the end of 2004, went down to Fort Hood, Texas for seven weeks of training and then deployed into uh, country, arriving on the 17th of February, 2005. Uh, interesting group of people. Uh, the 22 of us from Nebraska joined about another 180 soldiers, uh, of which 80 were National Guard soldiers, volunteers from uh, 14 different states. The other 100 were U.S. Army Reserve soldiers. They were involuntary mobilized, so they just got the notice to show up. And uh, they were from five different USAR commands. All told, there were 24 states contributing soldiers from two components, and almost none of us had ever met before, trained before, or had any idea of, uh, of really what we were doing, where we were going. Well, we knew where we were going, but we didn't know what the mission entailed. And as luck would have it, I was the senior officer, so I was responsible for trying to get this herd of geese together and, and move on down the road. So arrival in, in Afghanistan. Uh, Afghanistan, you know, we say it as a joke when we arrived because there was a sign at the airport uh, when I got off the uh, military transport. It said, welcome to Afghanistan. Please set your clock back 700 years. And in, in many ways, that it really is fairly accurate uh, in, in so many ways. And I'll, I'll show you throughout the presentation that there are certain aspects of the country and society there that truly is medieval and, and remains that way today. Uh, so many, many challenges uh, to be faced. And, and of course, setting that sort of a, in, an, in that environment, setting that stage, you can understand why maybe that was a location that uh, terrorists and Al-Qaeda used as a, as a haven, if you will, for their training camps because they were able to operate there with virtual impunity uh, prior to 9-11. Uh, so upon arrival uh, in, in Afghanistan, uh, I was assigned to what was called Regional Corps Advisory Group East, uh, headquartered in Gardez, Afghanistan. 
And this is a picture of uh, myself in the Gardez municipality uh, right after arrival. Uh, very rustic. And uh, this time of year, of course, the weather uh, in that particular area is similar to here in many respects. The altitude was much higher. Uh, where I was at there, standing was 7,500 feet, and it went up from there. If you look at the outfit I'm wearing uh, with the, uh, the IBA, they call it the individual body armor, uh, the, the helmet, the weapons, and two basic loads of uh, ammunition, it started out at uh, 53 pounds of weight that I carried before we added any water or any food or any other mission essential equipment. So it was a uh, wonderful weight loss program. Uh, to kind of also set the stage, if you look, normally whenever you find a map of, of Afghanistan in any sort of an atlas, Afghanistan's always in that center crease so you can never see it. Uh, so it's tough to find an accurate map. But if you look at the neighborhood that it's in, uh, we, we refer to it as the Stan Brothers uh, with Pakistan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan, uh, more or less surrounding it on the north, south, and east and then I ran to the west. Uh, not exactly the best neighborhood. And uh, geography, if you study geography at all, you can understand why that country is, uh, is so isolated because of the, the, uh, the Hindu Kush and mountain ranges, the Tora Bora mountain ranges around there, pretty, pretty well isolated. So how do you get in and out of a country that far that's landlocked? And there is no infrastructure. Uh, the road, when I say infrastructure, I'm talking mainly transportation, well, frankly, any infrastructure. But right now, uh, transportation-wise, you can't drive there, or it's very, very challenging. Um, certainly, we can't back a ship up and un unload anything on the docks. Uh, although we do some of that through Pakistan, generally speaking, the majority of all supplies, all personnel flow in by air. And in this case, or in my case, uh, Actually, in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan, we have a, a, a staging base called Manas, which is uh, right way up here. Bishkek borders on the China border, or uh, Kyrgyzstan does. We fly into there, and that's where we, we stage for the flight down into Afghanistan itself. I flew right into uh, Kabul International Airport, uh, which by U.S. standards was really not much more than a runway, and continued our mission to fly out. Uh, just to the north, if you've heard of uh, Bagram uh, Air Force Base, it's an old Soviet base that, uh, that we have occupied now, and that's where uh, most, most of your military flights originate in and out of. And then to fly out, of course, uh, down to Qatar uh, is, is another one of the staging bases in, in our R&R Center, and then on into Kuwait, and then you join with uh, all of the soldiers in, uh, in Iraq for Operation Iraqi Freedom for the flights out. But very, uh, very touchy situation in, you know, where do we have overflight rights? Uh, for instance, we don't generally fly over Iranian airspace, which makes it very challenging for us to get in and out. And, and because it is landlocked and the transportation infrastructure is so poor, uh, there is only one functional railroad in, in Afghanistan, um, and functional in that they still have, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the rails, they haven't been pulled up for salvage or, or anything, uh, but the engineer or the uh, locomotives and, and rail cars really haven't been functional for, for decades. Uh, so everything moves either by air or by truck, and which exponentially increases the cost, as, as you can imagine. <clears throat> okay, the, they've divided the country up into really five separate areas. Each area has uh, a Afghan National Army Major Command that is responsible for the security. Within each one of those commands then is embedded the embedded training teams um, that I performed. And uh, as part of our role in the training uh, of, the, uh, of the Afghan Army, I also served as a senior advisor and mentor to general officers within the Afghan National Army. First six months was as a brigade level mentor uh, I was the chief advisor for Brigadier General Mohammed Akram. And then the uh, second half, I was promoted and moved up to command the, uh, the, the core group where I was the senior advisor for um, Major General Ramatuli Rofi, who was the core commander within Regional Corps Advisory Group East, headquartered in Gardez. So this was our, our piece of, uh, of the pie, if you will, uh, right along the Pakistani border. 
uh, Tora Bora Mountains were right in this region. Supposedly, this is where Osama bin Laden uh, escaped into Pakistan, and depending on who you listen to, may still be there today. Uh, so you have five corps, the 201st Corps, 203rd, 205th, 209th, and then Central Corps that uh, actually uh, are, are there to provide the internal security for, um, for, the, uh, for the country. More specifically, if you look down to where, where we were at, we had five provinces. Uh, the country is divided up into uh, uh, provinces, and then within those provinces are districts. So a province would equal a state, district would equal county, I guess, to put it in simple terms. Uh, in, in our country, I had Paktika, Ghazni, Paktia, Coast, and Logar. These were the, the five primary provinces that we had. Uh, within each, each we had uh, 14, uh, we called them FOBs, forward operating bases. Uh, spread throughout where we had all of our embedded trainers, their Afghan National Army counterparts, uh, uh, focused in, in our case, we didn't have the luxury to do a lot of training because we were in the middle of a war uh, against the, uh, the insurgents. So in, in many ways, you know, there's an analogy that you can use that we're trying to tune the car, the, you know, the engine on the car while you're driving down the road. And, and that's in fact what we were doing. So. Our training missions were actually uh, operational missions as we were, that we were conducting uh, against the enemy. So what, did, what are we doing in Afghanistan in, in, in our particular mission? And I have to divide the mission up because certainly there is an operational mission there where we have our, our combat forces actively conducting operations against the enemy. And then you have the training and mentoring mission where we work specifically with the Afghan National Army, which has now expanded to the Afghan National Police, so that uh, they can provide security for their own country e eventually. Because right now, even though they have large numbers, they simply don't have the expertise and equipment to, to actively engage the enemy uh, by themselves. So we still have our own combat forces and country. So the Nebraska role, though, is uh, to date has been specifically training the Army and now, again, has expanded to the uh, Afghan National Police. Uh, very interesting situation with that. It is a coalition force that is helping with the training mission. So we've got the, the Americans teaching basic training for the soldiers. We have the British teaching the NCO Corps, the Non-Commissioned Officer Corps, and we have the French teaching the officers uh, with senior Afghan leadership that were all trained by the Russians and were all trying to teach them American tactics and doctrine. Many, many, many challenges uh, with that uh, that go far beyond just the, the language barriers that we have. Uh, so with that, we have to develop the military doctrine uh, actually run their training sites, uh, the, the, the basic training sites, and now their officer training uh, schools as well. Uh, the, in a coalition environment, uh, I had a, a Romanian battalion that worked for me for the, for the whole year I was there. Uh, I also had a Marine battalion that worked for me. And uh, you talk about cultural differences, although frankly I'm not sure where the cultural difference was the greatest between me and the Romanians or me and the Marines, but uh, it was, there were, there were just many challenges. Uh, but the good news is everybody was contributing to the fight, contributing to the mission, and, and doing everything they can to make sure it's successful. So again, the goal of our mission is to enable Afghanistan to provide its own security. Because without security, uh, it's very hard for any sort of democratic society to take root and, and to actually form and have a, a chance for, for success. Uh, this mission is now expanding for Nebraska. Uh, in addition to the embedded training team and uh, both the Army and the police, which currently we have two teams in country, uh, two 16-person teams conducting both of those missions. We also have now a new uh, team that's uh, just starting its training to deploy into Afghanistan. It'll be around 50 people, <clears throat> and its mission is called, it's an ADT, an Agricultural Development Team. So in addition to helping the country uh, be able to provide its own security, now we're going to try to teach them to provide, you know, to be able to feed themselves. Uh, again, I mentioned before, it's, it's medieval. And frankly, 
in the agricultural sector, it's very true. Um, they, they just need lots of help on, on simple things like irrigation, uh, land erosion, uh, hydrology, uh, all of those sorts of things that we take for granted within our ag uh, community here in Nebraska, but it's just so far beyond where the, these folks are. And, and over 70% of the population in Afghanistan is engaged in agriculture. Admittedly, a large percentage of that is in growing illegal drugs, but the goal is, is if we can provide them a viable uh, means of supporting themselves with, with normal crops and, and, and uh, subsidies that they can support themselves with, it will pull some people or a majority of them away from the illicit drug growth. So again, uh, soil sciences, irrigation, agronomy, horticulture, animal husbandry, uh, partnering with the Afghan universities, reaching back to our own universities and expertise here in Nebraska to truly help the Afghan folks. As we got this mission, we discovered that we actually have partnerships with Afghanistan already in place, uh, some of which I knew about, uh, some I didn't. Uh, for instance, I didn't know that Scotts Bluff and Garing is partnered with Bamiyan, which is a city and in, in province within central Afghanistan because they have very same growing conditions, same soil conditions. And this is an ongoing relationship that's been there for a number of years where they've actually exchanged people uh, and expertise on, on you know, and assisting them, which is one of the reasons why I think Bamiyan province is one of the most productive uh, agriculturally in the country, especially you know, in, in what we would consider uh, good type growth where it's uh, uh, you know, sugar beets and, and corn and wheat and those sorts of things. So uh, again, another evolution in our role. Again, our primary mission when we arrived was to train the Afghan National Army. Uh, we deployed uh, part of our Regional Training Inst Institute, which is headquartered at uh, Camp Ashland in Ashland, Nebraska. Their mission was to run the basic training camp and to try to, uh, again, instill some basic professionalism within the military and so they reach a, a very basic uh, level of training and expertise before they would deploy downrange to where we were. Their society in Afghanistan is very, very tribal in that there's, there's, there are many major tribes throughout the country, the, the Tajiks, the Pashtus, the Hazaras, uh, among, uh, among others. And within the tribe, of course, then you have clans and families. It's very family and clan and tribe oriented to assist in breaking down some of those barriers and try to get some sense of a national identity, they made a conscious decision that every battalion, uh, which in their case I think is around 550 soldiers, uh, which was referred to as a Kandak, which is the Afghan term for, for battalion, they would put in exact percentages to reflect what the population in the country was. So the, the Pashtu majority would be 40 percent of each of each uh, Kandak, of each battalion. Uh, same with Tajiks and Hazars and, and all of the other ethnic groups, so that they could try to break down some of those ethnic issues that they've got. Afghanistan's a country that's fought within itself uh, for thousands of years, and the only time that they would band together would be to repel an enemy, and that's how they, that what they did with the Soviets. And that's one of the reasons that led to the issues we have there is when the Soviets left, all of these tribes uh, that were fighting as a team now started to fight amongst each other to say who would be in charge of their country. And that's how it devolved into a civil war and, and aided in the setting the conditions for uh, the enemy to take, uh, take over, if you will, or the Taliban. So in an effort to break those barriers down, uh, they have an ethnic diversity uh, mandate between all of those. And then so you have, again, deployed all the way across the country the people of Afghanistan get to see all of the ethnic groups working together and in, in providing for their security. Really, uh, uh, frankly, in their case, it's a very, very good policy. Uh, again, Kabul Military Training Center, they graduate. Uh, you can kind of tell, again, we'll never get away from the Soviet influence. Uh, they marched with the big old goose step, just like uh, the Soviets did, and, and to see them in their dress uniforms, it just sends shivers up your spine. Uh, downrange, this is uh, down in coast. Uh, very in the southeast part of, uh, of our area. Uh, that's General Akram uh, reviewing his troops. We had a Kandak, about 500 soldiers stationed down there. 
Uh, and we often got on the road to do visitations to go see how his deployed soldiers were doing, uh, myself with the embedded trainers. Each CANDAC, each battalion would have a team of roughly 16 of uh, U.S. soldiers that would live with them, work with them, eat with them, train with them, uh, deploy with them on missions, so they were with them all the time. It was part of the credibility that they had to have because, frankly, the Afghan people, they're fighters, they're warriors. They know war. Frankly, that's all they know. Um, so we needed to be there with them just to gain the credibility so that they would listen to us and trust us uh, and, and fight right alongside them. So, but they were used to very small, small unit type organizations or, or, or operations where four or five or six soldiers uh, or Mujahideen would deploy to watch a, a road intersection uh, with just their weapons. You know, so they would go buy a sheep and a bag of rice and they could su sustain themselves for a couple weeks up there. But now you add in all of the ammunition resupply, the uniform requirements, uh, transportation, uh, larger unit tactics, it was just, it was beyond what they could, uh, what they could really get their arms around. And so that was our role. Uh, plus, in all honesty, uh, we, we were the reach back. If somebody ever got hurt, you know, that was their only way that we could medevac them out to medical treatment. Uh, more importantly is if they got in a situation, and we, we called it a tick, uh, troops in contact, the only way that they could get close air support was through us. Um, and frankly, at the end of the day, we also carried the checkbook uh, to, to sustain these people, to purchase the food and, and, and whatever other supplies that they needed because uh, their government, at least at that time, simply had no wherewithal to do that. Um, there, there just was no, no resources to, to be able to sustain this sort of an operation at that time. So Afghan soldiers. Told you they came from all different uh, ethnic groups, but we did a, a little bit of a survey, and your average Afghan soldier was between 18 and 21 years old, came from a family of 11 to 12 kids, of which seven might still be alive, had never seen a doctor, had never seen a dentist, couldn't read or write, but was willing to be there to fight for the freedom of his country and for a better future uh, for their kids. Uh, you, know, you, you think about that. Um, you go back to why they know how to fight. I mean, they, that's, that's all they know. That's all they've known. Um, the disease, uh, the health care system, which is non-existent, uh, was, was unbelievable. So again, you had, uh, and you can see, you know, you can kind of tell, uh, you, know, you have three different eth ethnic groups uh, represented in this particular picture. Uh, the weapons that we used, most all of the equipment that the Afghan army received was, was frankly, was all donated. Uh, a lot of the weapon systems were left over from the Soviets, uh, so we tried to keep it that way in that the Soviet block style weapons, the AK-47s in that family was what, uh, uh, what we issued. Uh, some of the other countries, the former Soviet bloc countries donated many, many thousands of these weapons and ammunition to sustain them. Uh, the trucks that we got came from everywhere, from uh, India to Pakistan to the United States to uh, Russia, uh, Czech Republic, Romania. I mean, just a mixture of everything. Um, uniforms, uh, depending on what they were wearing at the time, most of the uh, uniforms came from the United States, but the other equipment that they had was donated from Italy, uh, France, just everywhere. So uniformity was always a, a challenge even down to their Green Berets, which they were very, very proud of, but you can tell, uh, obviously, different countries donated Berets at different times. Very, very beautiful country. If you look in the background behind the soldier, I mean, it's just uh, the vast expanse, the mountain ranges, uh, just, just breathtaking, uh, up around our neighborhood anyway, up in the mountains. Um, but like a lot of places, I guess, from a distance, it really looks nice, and up close, it's not quite as nice. But uh, again, soldier up there, uh, on, well, taking a break uh, off a of patrol with his uh, AK-47 and uh, again trying to relax a little bit. Um, again, operational missions, we were with them every time they went out. Uh, we were with them uh, for all the reasons I stated before. 
As the uh, primary military advisor to the senior leadership within our core area, many opportunities to, uh, to brief the leadership, try to teach them military decision-making processes, staff actions, uh, how, how to run a staff of a large-scale organization. A brigade, an Afghan National Army brigade, was, it was supposed to be about 3,500 soldiers, uh, normally filled at about 3,000. Uh, the core was, we had all told, two brigades plus uh, the core staff was around 7,000 soldiers. Um, the officer seated on the far right, that's General Rofi, the Corps commander. So he, be, between he and I, we, uh, we controlled over 7,000 U.S. And, uh, and Afghan soldiers within those five provinces. Uh, you can also tell there is uh, two other coalition people there. Uh, that funny uniform in the center is, uh, is a British officer that was there with us for a while. I want to talk about communication was always an issue, too. Uh, for instance, a simple briefing like this would take twice as long because I would have to say a very short sentence and allow my interpreter then to, uh, to say his part. And uh, it, it just it took lots of time. Now, my interpreter here, uh, standing, standing up there in the black jacket, uh, Asan, spoke English very well, but didn't speak Army speak. Um, those of you who have been around soldiers know that we kind of have our own language. And it was very hard for him to interpret sometimes when I use Army terminology, Army acronyms. Uh, so we had to really break it down to, to just your, your, your basic level. Uh, an example is we were out with a general on one of our forward operating bases, and with the soldier on guard duty, we, I asked him if he could describe to me what his field of fire was. And of course, field of fire is, is you know, the, your piece of the pie that you orient your weapon you know, within that field so you know you can see the enemy, you know, you know where, if they're coming, where your engagement zone is. And of course, the interpreter looked at me, Alex looked at me real funny and, and then said something and then it came back and he goes, uh, sir, the general would like to know why you want to set our fields on fire. <laughs> So the language issues were, were pretty significant, uh, but uh, it did make for some very, very entertaining uh, moments. Uh, myself and General Akram and Alex again, uh, the whole country, at least at that time, was frankly a munitions dump. Uh, you could find ammunition, uh, we called UXOs, un unexploded or ordnance, uh, everywhere. Uh, there were caches in the most unusual places, and we found some, this is one, uh, there was a series of these caves uh, in the side of a mountain just outside of Gardez that had truckloads, literally truckloads of, of, of uh, large caliber ammunition, mortar rounds, uh, rockets, all of these things. And it was just sitting there unsecured. Um, frankly, we were paying people to tell us where they were so that we could go uh, confiscate it and then destroy it. Or if it was usable, issue it back to the Afghan National Army so that they would have uh, ammunition resupply. Uh, when the Soviets left, you know, I, I had read it, I had heard it, and I had been briefed on it, that when the Soviets left, they left everything. They just dropped it and walked away, or ran away in, in this case. And boy, it's true. That country was just littered with everything. And, and the good news is a lot of it we could find. We were able to take care of. Bad news is there's still many kids today uh, walking around that, that hit some of the millions of landmines that are still scattered around that country. Uh, that the, so the, another legacy of the, uh, of the Soviets. There were a lot of folks that didn't want us there, that wanted to make sure that this country stayed the way it was. A haven for terrorists, Al-Qaeda, uh, the Taliban, um, to do the, the extreme Islamist religion. So they would do what they could to get rid of us or to scare us away or to convince the local population that the government was ineffective and that we were part of the problem, that we were the enemy. This is uh, a rocket that we found on the mountains up above uh, our camp. Uh, and you can see our, our home, uh oh, battery's dying, right here. That's our, that's our camp. And uh, what they would do, I mean, the the poverty in the country was amazing. What they would do, the enemy would do, would be hire these folks that we saw up in the mountain all the time collecting uh, scrub brush, for lack of a better term, just so that they would have something to burn to, to heat and to cook, cook with. 
Well, they'd pay him uh, just a small amount of money to carry this thing up and, and leave it up there. And then during the night, the, uh, the actual enemy would go up then and, and prop it up and, and set it and put the fuse on it. And of course, they, they would fire off. And uh, in one week's time, we had, oh, I don't know, four or five rocket attacks, if you will. Granted, this isn't the most accurate means of deploying a rocket, but uh, you know, it only takes once. And even a blind squirrel finds an acorn once in a while. So uh, we were able to interdict it a lot. Um, at this point, the enemy broke the unwritten rule. Up until that point, it was OK to attack the Americans, but you didn't attack the Afghans. Well, this crossed over the line, and that energized the, the, the Afghan leadership to the point where we all of a sudden had a lot more success in interdicting the enemy uh, when they were trying to do things like this. Again, another uh, example of uh, munitions that we would find, just unbelievable, uh, staggering the amounts that we would, we would just find laying around. A lot of our mission, as I said, would be to travel around throughout our five provinces. We needed to demonstrate uh, that, that, that we, we as the, that they really as the Army and we in support, were there to support everybody, to provide them the security. To do that, we had to be mobile. We had to have a presence. Um, the road system, as I said, were, was non-existent. On the maps that we had, this actually was depicted as an improved highway. Uh, and frankly, we were lucky and then we had what they call a blue force tracker. What it amounts to is, a, is about the highest speed GPS navigation system that you could imagine with a moving map display, uh, all this whiz bang stuff in our vehicles because to, uh, a map was all but worthless. I mean, it was the only way that we could really uh, navigate around the country successfully. Uh, the roads, uh, in fact, I, I just, I was fortunate in about an hour ago, hour and a half ago, one of the soldiers that we have, uh, Colonel Mark Stocksdale, who is in Gardez, Afghanistan today, called me. We talked about this, and this is the road that he just went over, uh, uh, over what they call the KD Pass, down into, uh, into Gardez, although it's winter time, so there's still a lot of snow and ice. But it's, it's really, it's a, uh, it's a camel path that's evolved over the years, and they ran a bulldozer over it and turned it into a dirt path. But OSHA isn't around there. There are no guardrails. Uh, that steep drop off on the edge is real. Uh, it, uh, it makes for some very interesting times. Um, the, again, road network's terrible. They're very industrious and inventive people. Uh, they, they tore apart some old Soviet uh, track vehicles and, and made a bridge out of it. Uh, you know, whatever works. Again, the, the challenges that we had in moving the Afghans, they have no, no personnel movers. They have no way to move these soldiers around, so they, they had uh, hundreds, hundreds of these Ford Ranger four-door pickups that became their urban assault vehicles, if you will. Uh, <clears throat> and they would just load them up, stack them in, and, and away they'd go. They'd ride, they'd ride for hours like this. Rain, snow, didn't make any difference. Tough, tough people. This is me in my, my, my mobile office. This is my up-armored Humvee uh, going through some of the dust and nasty stuff we did. So I was all bundled up trying to keep from breathing too much of it. But if you uh, look just to my left, uh, the, the screen, that's the Blue Force Tracker screen that uh, has the moving map display. I had normally four, at least three, if not four different means of communication. At any given time, I could count on maybe one of them. Because uh, again, no infrastructure. The only satellite communications were, were reasonably reliable. The high frequency and FM radios that we had were marginal, uh, and even cell phones, uh, which again, were, were very marginal as well. But uh, that's, that's my cocoon that I traveled around the country in. And again, wide changes in climate, geography, um, and we had to be out in all weather, all times. And of course, there's no, not only is there no road maintenance equipment or road maintenance, certainly there's no snow removal. So we were pretty much on our own. We had to be pretty careful. There's a reason why that country historically does not do any military operations in the winter, because they have no way to move, no way to sustain, uh, and you know, it just, it just doesn't work. Uh, of course, it's hard on us as well. You know, it just makes things very challenging, as it would here. So at Gardez, what did I do? Uh, again, every day I would meet with the general officers, spend an hour or two with them, discussing issues and problems that we had that day, uh, and how we might, I would propose solutions to them, uh, or, or try to get them to, to, to come up with the right answer so it was their idea. 
on, on how to do that. So again, sitting with our interpreters uh, every day, we'd meet with them and try to guide them along a path. Uh, in the upper right, uh, again, that's on one of our visits. Uh, General Akram there just uh, smoking on a cigarette. He, and, and drinking tea, you see in front of us, we, I really learned to drink chai tea. That was, uh, that was the drink of choice. Um, sometimes they actually washed the cup before they gave it to me. Uh, high, you know, and I'll talk a little bit more about food and those sorts of things here in a little bit. But, and he had stopped by a roadside vendor and bought a big plate of uh, chicken that we were enjoying. Uh, and if you notice uh, on the top left there, uh, as, you know, I, I'm old enough to be a huge MASH fan, and I had to have my MASH pole, and that says Nebraska, uh, 7,355 miles. <laughs> you had an idea where we are. Gardez, this, is, this was home. This was uh, our, our FOB, our forward operating base, where, the, where our U.S. folks stayed at. Uh, within that, we had uh, a special forces uh, uh, a team. We had uh, the provincial reconstruction team. We also always had a combat of what we called war fighters. Originally it was a marine company and it was replaced by an uh, army infantry company out of the 82nd Airborne. And then we had all of us uh, embedded trainers. Um, you know, secured within our compound 24-7. Uh, uh, we had to go out, of course, when uh, we're working with the Afghan army. But they kept us pretty well separated and at this time Frankly, that was, a, that was a real good idea. Another view of, uh, of our compound, the beautiful mountain range in the back, uh, just on the other side of that is the uh, Shycott Valley. If uh, Ap Operation Anaconda, which was the very first, or, or the very first large scale military operation that the US conducted there, was just over on the other side of that. So we were, frankly, in the, in the, uh, in the middle of uh, bad guy country. But uh, just beautiful place at a distance. Across the road, they were building, we were building, a, a, a core headquarters and a military installation. That uh, represents construction on a roughly $70 million worth of U.S. money to build this Afghan National Army uh, brigade and core headquarters camp. It would be able to hold uh, up to almost 5,000 soldiers permanently. Uh, with uh, the mess hall facilities, the dining facilities, all the facilities it needed to sustain them over a long period. Its own power generation, its own water treatment, uh, all of those sorts of things. Interesting though, the Afghan input into this, you know, we wanted to give them more modern amenities. For instance, uh, in, the, in the dining facility, the stoves to be either gas or electric or something, and they wouldn't allow us to do that. Um, so it's all wood fired. So they have to haul in truckloads of wood to burn. And of course, their issue was, well, when you leave, we need to be able to sustain this. And they didn't know how to, or, or weren't willing to accept the responsibility of anything more than just wood, because that's what they do. Same thing with the water treatment. We wanted to uh, make it you know, potable water. Uh, but they wouldn't allow us to do that either, because they were afraid that uh, the soldiers would get soft. And that way, when they were out on missions and having to drink the local water, they would get sick. So we wanted to keep the water uh, same as what they were used to. So needless to say, we were even though we put the water treatment facility in, we all had to drink bottled water. Uh, another view of the same camp, uh, looking from a different direction, the barracks, uh, the headquarters buildings, um, quite an installation. And we were building, at the time, we were building five of these across the country. And I think there were another five more that were in, uh, in the plan. Great people, had great experiences with them. Uh, top left, that, uh, top right, excuse me, that's a battalion commander uh, down in Sharon. It, you couldn't show up without getting gifts. Uh, and he gave me flowers, which were interesting, um, and, a, and a hat, <laughs> which didn't fit. Um, but just wonderful, gener generous folks. Uh, down below, uh, General Rofi and myself and uh, Colonel Pat Donahue. He was the commander of the combat forces, the 82nd Airborne Brigade that was in the area. We signed a, 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 a partnership between our three entities to work together to provide security and to train the Afghan army. First time that had ever been done in theater. And this was a picture we took right after we had all signed it. Uh, didn't know if I had the authority to do it, but we did it anyway. And uh, actually it was very successful. It, uh, it really, it, it helped so much within that region. 
uh, because that way when the war fighters, the combat boys would go out, they'd always have Afghan folks with them. Again, you need that to have them build credibility to, to sustain security. Always had, Gardez was close enough to Kabul that we'd always get some interesting visitors. Uh, top photo from right to left. The right is the ambassador to U.S. ambassador to uh, Afghanistan. Uh, next to him is uh, Mr. Stephen Hadley, the national security advisor to the President Bush, General Rofi, um, and then the uh, the senior General Eikenberry, the senior military commander in country, and me. Down below uh, on the right, uh, that's Governor Taniwal. He was the governor of Paktia Province, a uh, personal friend of uh, President Karzai. Uh, and no, that is not an authorized part of the uh, U.S. Army uniform, but uh, we had just opened up a school, and uh, as a, uh, an honor, I guess, to me, they, they turbanized me and uh, made me one of them, I guess. Uh, and, of course, it didn't fit either. Uh, urban planning is something they don't do a lot of. Um, when they start a village, it just kind of keeps getting added on and added on. Uh, to give you an idea of some of the, you know, the, the complexity and challenges we have on the ground trying to uh, do operations in, in these sorts of, uh, this sort of an environment. Uh, the food I told you to tell you about, the original uh, dining facility kitchen is up there on the upper left. Uh, and, and how they would do the food, the, the kitchen patrol, the dining room help. Uh, everything was cooked over wood fires. Chicken was the staple. Uh, but if you had a VIP coming, they would pull out all the stops. And on the bottom right, that's a, another Kandakar battalion commander that we visited uh, in Ghazni. And he put out a spread, and you know it was important when the cans of Pepsi came out. <laughs> that was extremely important to them. That was, uh, that was a, a sheer sign of, uh, of wealth, I guess. If we were out in the field, this was their field kitchen. Uh, that was a cook that we contracted with, his helper, which was his son. A couple of pots leaned up against a, a wall, and, and they just stoke a fire underneath it and boil the food and rice, and uh, you know, that was it. Uh, you look at the food storage. You go through any any village. Uh, in the morning, they would they would slaughter the cattle. Uh, in our case, they'd, they'd hang them underneath uh, the bridge and just let everything wash away, and then they'd throw uh, these sides and slabs of beef into a wheelbarrow and hike them up the hill and then just hang them in front of the, of the meat shop. Uh, you know, if you notice here in the top left, that stump with a big machete next to it, that's how he'd cut off whatever it was that you actually asked for or paid for. Um, and this is in the spring where there weren't many bugs, but uh, as you can imagine, it was. Uh, this is another reason why we have the agricultural development teams with the, the, uh, the, the meat and produce folks going along to help them uh, understand that that's not the best way to display and, and issue out uh, food. Life for us. You, know, you try to make make home what it is. Uh, an American soldier is about as in, ingenious as, as you could imagine in being able to do that. Um, you know, we referred to it as Groundhog Day. We've all seen the movie because every day seemed to be the same. Um, the Afghans would make the same mistakes. We'd do the same training, the same thing over and over again. So we had to retreat back into our own lives to do whatever we did just to maintain our own sanity. Because uh, it was a seven-day-a-week job. We tried to give everybody a day off, but that didn't always happen. Uh, so, again, we, we try to pull back and do whatever we needed to do to have fun. One of the most rewarding experiences we had is working with the local population. Uh, the bottom two pictures, we visited a lot of schools. Uh, both of those are schools. Um, education is something that the, uh, the, the people are so very proud of is that their, their children will get something they didn't have, and that's uh, in education. So a lot of the donations we solicited that we handed out were school supplies. And it just meant so much because they, had, they have no paper, they have no pencils, they have almost nothing. But they, what they do have is a piece of chalkboard propped up against a rock and, and somebody, a teacher that's volunteering because they have no way to pay them uh, to actually try to teach uh, the kids and, and, and give them some rudimentary uh, education. Very, very rewarding experience. Uh, this was the superintendent of the school. We would work with him initially, say, we've got this, uh, these supplies for you, uh, you know, to make sure it was okay with him, because uh, there's politics at every level. Uh, he loved us, enjoyed having us there, we were able to provide him uh, things for, for his school and for the children, most of which actually made it to the children after he t I'm sure he took his cut and sold it at the bazaar. Uh, one of our soldiers' father, <laughs> 
got a, uh, it was an auto parts store in Missouri that had all these hats they didn't need, so they mailed them all to us. Unofficially became the school hat, part of their uniform, and for months, you'd go by that school, and they'd run out there waving every one of them wearing their bright red hats. They just, just loved it. Uh, this was a school opening that we had uh, where we built a uh, very nice school for them. They make uh, quite a deal out of it. You know, you had uh, the governor, uh, the chief of police, the Afghan brigade commander, uh, all of us that actually wrote the check. Um, together, everyone had a chance to speak, drink your tea, and have a meal afterwards. Uh, real big thing. And this was where I met. Uh, this is the Ministry of Education for, uh, for Afghanistan. Real nice individual. Uh, spoke English, thankfully, uh, and uh, had a very good visit with him. But it, again, education is uh, so very important. Although I did find things in their schools that you wouldn't normally find in ours. Uh, this is a little bit tough to see, but if you look at it, it's pictures of what the children should do if they find unexploded ordnance or weapons or mines or those sorts of things. Um, you know, don't throw rocks at it. Don't burn it. Don't step on it. Uh, don't beat it with a rock. Uh, it's sad, but the reality of it is that's the environment that they live in because, again, millions and millions of mines and other ordnance are scattered all over the country. The majority of the medical evacuation requests we had that involved civilians were all kids uh, that, uh, that got in the wrong place. Uh, this is at Bagram Air Force Base looking back at uh, the Hindukush mountain ranges. Again, just just breathtaking the beauty that uh, this country has to offer from a distance. Um, never forgetting, of course, it is combat. Um, soldiers are being, are being lost. Uh, fortunately, in Afghanistan, not nearly as often uh, there as in other places, uh, but it did happen to us uh, while I was there. Fortunately, it was only one soldier that was, uh, that was killed, uh, many others wounded, and uh, of course, we did the uh, appropriate honors. A uh, picture of my headquarters. Uh, I had uh, this flag stand built, uh, the American flag, of course, the Afghan flag, the Romanian flag, and the Nebraska state flag. Very important for us to remember where we came from. And as a Nebraskan uh, and, and the guy in charge, it was my choice to have them in here. So what's, where are we at today? In the last five years, uh, how many folks from your Nebraska Guard has deployed, and where, where have they gone? Uh, this was the current numbers uh, as of yesterday. Uh, so we've had over 2,300 soldiers deployed to Iraq, over 100 to Afghanistan, to the uh, Balkans, either Bosnia or Kosovo, uh, or Serbia, uh, over 400. And then here in CONUS, either with Operation Jump Start as we secure our southern border, or all of the initial Armored Falcon and different operations we did uh, immediately after 9-11, uh, securing our own airports, and other uh, critical uh, facilities. So total numbers, like I said, almost 3,300. And right now, today, we, are thir we have 3,682 soldiers in the Nebraska Army Guard. Um, so I tell the soldiers all the time, you, you know, there's three types of soldiers left, those that have deployed, those that will deploy, and those that will deploy again. Uh, that's just our, our current reality. And if you've read any of the local newspaper articles recently, uh, they've interviewed a lot of those uh, fantastic warriors that we've got. Uh, so with that, uh, I know I've said not as much as I wanted, but at least a little bit of time for questions. If, uh, if there's anything that uh, you'd like to know, I'd be happy to entertain those at this time. Yes, sir. So what kind of progress do you think you've made in the last um, four or five years over there? Progress is tough to measure. Uh, the, okay, the, the question is, uh, what type of progress have we made since we've, we've been in it for the last three or four years? Um, progress by American standards is, is frankly minimal, but you can't use American standards when you look at a country such as this. Uh, you know, just being able to convince 3,000 soldiers that if they wash their hands before they eat a meal, that they won't get sick. Uh, was, I mean, to me, that's huge progress. We, we reduced our sick call rate from as many as 200 a day down to 10 a day, just by simple preventive medicine measures like that. Th that's a huge leap forward. Um, in where you measure it by our standards, eh, you know, that doesn't just seem like it's that, that much. Uh, overall, uh, though in a more strategic viewpoint, I think we've made tremendous progress. We have an education system that, that is in place, as rudimentary as it is, 
it's in place because we were there and we are there to provide the security so that they can actually start the system. And, and frankly, that's, that's our key to success, in my opinion, is the next generation. Uh, to, to educate them, make them understand that there's, there's a world outside of, of their family and tribe uh, in, in a more global perspective, you know, and, and that education is really, really the key to that. There were, again, no infrastructure, no radios, no TVs. They're illiterate, so they can't read newspapers. The only contact that 80% of the villages had with the outside world was through the one educated person they had, which was a mula which really meant, in some cases, they memorized a part of the Quran. So that was their only conduit to any sort of education or outside information. So you can see how easy they were influenced, if you will. So education is the key, and, and the progress we've made, again, by U.S. standards, really isn't that great, but by Afghan standards, huge, huge. So the progress is being made. Yes, sir. Again, it depends on the mission. If he goes to, um, if, he, if he's part of the embedded training team uh, concept, which again, I had a Marine battalion that worked for me, yes, that was what their mission was and that's what they did every day. If he deploys as part of the combat force, I, I would say yes, but. Their primary mission is to engage the enemy. Now, uh, when I left, they, they would do that with the Afghans. Uh, again, they have to put an Afghan face on everything so that it gives credibility to the Army their security forces and their government, and that they're not just a puppet of the United States. So I would expect that uh, that your son would have that experience, that he would be able, to, that he will work with the Afghans uh, as you know as they do their operations. You know, maybe not quite as intimately, uh, cl as closely as as I did, uh, or the embedded trainers do, but he certainly would have exposure to it. Yes, sir. Are the Afghans able to su support themselves agriculturally now? Uh, the answer to that would be yes in terms of total acreage or hectares of arable and, and tillable land. Uh, they would have the ability. In fact, they did have the ability. Uh, you don't have to go back that many decades to see that not only could they sustain themselves, but they were also uh, an export. They were an exporter of agricultural products. So the potential is there. Uh, understand because of the environment that was created, though, so much of that potential now has gone to illicit drugs. And so they've become an importer of all major foodstuffs. Um, with that, uh, I, I, uh, I'll, I'll stay as, around as long as we possibly can. I do need to kind of wrap up the formal part, but it, certainly I'll stay and ask any questions that you have. Um, I, as a final thought, uh, I know over the years there's been a lot of concern over our, our new generation, our younger generation of, of, of Americans. Uh, the McDonald's generation, or, or, or they're lazy, they're fat, they, they're not motivated. Uh, I got to tell you, my opportunity in here and who I work with every day, I got, there's nothing more wrong with, than that statement. These are great folks. I mean, they are, you can be proud of everything that they're doing. <clears throat> they're working so hard and doing amazing things under the most horrendous conditions that you can't help but be proud of them, to sit there and watch and just be in awe of the spirit the attitude uh, that these fine young Americans and young Nebraskans just, you know, demonstrate every day while they're out there approaching their mission and, again, one of the most unforgiving environments in the whole world. So uh, please keep them in your thoughts and prayers. Uh, know that uh, we believe we're, doing, we're making a difference in the world, uh, that these soldiers are, are making a difference, and that uh, there's a lot there for everybody to be proud of. Great. Thank you.